Amen. Go ahead and open up your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. And we're continuing our uh, series on uh, the armor of, of God. And when you pick up verse 10, the Holy Spirit through Paul tells us a final word. And I hope, I hope we're listening. Because Paul, through the Holy Spirit, has written some very important stuff for the believers and for us as believers. But you know, after, after everything that he has said and everything that he's taught, he said, listen, a, a final word. I need to tell you this, a final word. Be strong in the Lord. And be strong in His mighty power. How do we do that? Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able, not maybe, not might, not sometimes, but you will be able to stand firm against the, all the strategies of the devil. For we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. But against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. Against mighty powers in this dark world. And against evil spirits in the heavenly places. So put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, because we're going to have battles. There's going to be battles just because we're followers of Jesus. Matter of fact, Jesus tells us there's going to be more battles because you're my follower. So don't get discouraged. Don't get negative when, when, you're, when you're facing battles because the battles are going to come. But he says, uh, then after the battle, you will be still be standing firm. Stand your ground. How do we do that? Putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, you put on, the, uh, you put on peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. And the one we're going to be talking about today, put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. God, I just pray that you'll be with us as hearers today of your word. Holy Spirit, what you're teaching us right now, just through this reading, we know that even right now, that there's going to be powers coming against us right now at this moment to stop us from really listening to your word, from truly hearing your word today. So, Father, I pray today, That when our minds begin to wander, wander, 
And when, when, when we start to think about different things or, or, or whatever's going on around us, Lord, I pray that, that we understand that that's the evil one that's trying to distract us from your word today. So, Father, bless us today with open minds, open hearts, and help us not to just keep this in our mind, Father, but help us to put it into action in our lives. And it's in your Son's holy name that we pray. Amen. A couple of weeks ago at Galena Park in, a, in our Bible study time together, uh, just like Terry and Aaron do, we, we open up with prayer. And... Uh, there was one of the residents that live at the Galena Park apartments that had received uh, a kidney transplant. And so we were just thanking God for that, just praising God for it because he was near death, didn't think that he would even be a candidate for a kidney, and then he got it, he got the kidney transplant, and it changed everything about him doing great. So we started praising God for that, but we also started praising God for Him giving the wisdom to our medical professionals uh, that, that, man, we can transplant so many different things. I mean, we can transplant kidneys, we can transplant lungs, we can transplant a heart, we can transplant skin, you can transplant a hand. But one of the things that you can't transplant is the brain. We cannot give someone else someone else's mindset. And that shows how delicate our brains are, how delicate our minds are. And when you think about our, our world today, and we've been talking about it, if you haven't been coming to our class on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock here in the auditorium, I mean, it is really incredible. Really want to encourage you to come. Because it really does. I mean, everything that we've been studying with, is Jesus really serious in what he says? It really dovetails into what we've been talking about up here in my part portion. It just kind of ties it together. They're working in coordination. That's the Holy Spirit doing that. But when you think about our world today, you don't have to go very far out your front door that, that you begin to, to hear and to see and to feel there's so many people that are so overwhelmed with life. So much anxiety and stress. hopelessness no joy I mean it's just written all over people there's no joy because there's no hope and where that comes from it comes out of our mindset it comes out of their mindset And that's why it's important that the Holy Spirit, He tells us as believers that we need to put on the helmet of salvation. We need to put on salvation as the helmet that protects our mindset. Salvation. What is salvation? Salvation. The salvation is deliverance. Jesus has delivered us from sin. Jesus has delivered us from a hopeless life. I mean, if it wasn't for Jesus Christ going to that cross and becoming our sin and being resurrected on that third day, there, wasn't be, there wouldn't be any reason for us to have any hope at all because this would be it. And we would all be doomed for eternal hell. None of us, especially Jim, when we get at our age, right? We definitely wouldn't be looking forward 
oh man, now, you know, we're getting in our upper 60s and stuff. Man, there is nothing to look forward to. I mean, when we're young, we really don't think about it a whole lot. But as we get older, we begin to think and we begin to dwell on heaven. So salvation, but salvation is more, church, than, than just what took place when you gave your life to Jesus Christ. Salvation is more than just that moment when you were buried with Him in baptism. See, when we're buried with Jesus in baptism, as Romans 6, 4 tells us, man, and that, that's when we reenact what... And sometimes... I love the Galena Park Bible study because they ask questions that I, I don't even think about sometimes. It was asked the other day, well, if Jesus did everything on the cross and that's enough, then why are we baptized? Baptism is really for us. It is a very tangible way for us to experience what Jesus experienced when he was killed on that cross, he was buried in the ground, and he was resurrected with a brand new, as a brand new person, an eternal body, a heavenly body. When we're buried with Jesus in baptism, we have killed off the old self and we come up out of that water a brand new creation a brand new person but we have not arrived that is the beginning of our walk with Jesus. That's the transformation. That's when it begins in our lives is when we're baptized, we're buried, we kill off the old person and we're a brand new babe in Christ, a brand new baby in Christ. So salvation is more than just the moment whenever you experience the blood of Jesus Christ taking away all of your sins. Church, that's the beginning of salvation. Matter of fact, 2 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, anyone, who is anyone? Everyone. Anyone who belongs to Christ is a new person. The old life is gone, and the new life has begun. Salvation is a process. Salvation is not just a moment in time. Salvation is a lifelong process. And it cannot remain as head knowledge. Salvation has got to be something that we flesh out every single day, something that we realize is going on in our life. Because every, when we give our life to Jesus, man, we're new. Every single one of us are new. And that old life is gone. That old life, man, that, that is done. We are done with that old life. It is thrown away. It is gone. And the question that I want to ask you when you gave your life to Jesus Christ, did you get rid of the old life? Is it gone? Oh yeah, it's still going to creep up every so often, but are we just kind of walling in it and, and, and just, you know, just okay with it? Because He's given us a brand new life. And this is what's going to affect our mindset. This new life that Jesus has given us. So how do we begin to develop this mindset? And I think Galatians, if you flip back one, one letter of Paul's in Galatians chapter 5, it's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. Do 
Do you feel the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life every single day and every moment of every day? Or do we only feel the Holy Spirit when Aaron leads us in a, in a song, man, it just really goes down deep in our hearts. And man, I just feel the Holy Spirit now. I just want to lift my hands up in praise. But then just as soon as we walk out the door and get back into the world. I read this, oh, I don't know, several, I don't know, it's been weeks or whatever. He said, you know what, man, we get, we, we get up to heaven. And, and we see Moses. And so we run up to Moses and we say, Moses, 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 man, you got to tell me, man, what was it like to part the Red Sea? I just got to know, what was that feeling like? And, and then we run up to David and we tell, hey, David, man, you got to tell me, what was it like to stand before Goliath as a, 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 this, this warrior that everybody else was scared to death of? They were shaking in their boots. But here you are, just a little shepherd boy with a slingshot and five little stones, and you're standing before this giant and you slay this giant. I mean, tell me, what were you thinking? How, what were you feeling? And they were run up to Sarah. 90 years old, having a baby. And the Bible says that her body was as good as dead. She had never had any children. And now at 90 years old, and her husband at 100, she was, her body was as good as dead sexually, could not have a child. But yet at 90 years old, she had a baby. Can you imagine? Anita, I like to run up to her. Man, what was that like? Can we imagine? But then they turn to us and go, well, you know what? Before, before I, I've got to ask you a question. Man, what is it like having the Holy Spirit living in you every day? And when I read that, that just kind of, Kristen, it just kind of set me back. And I thought, wow. You see, they did not have the Holy Spirit living in them. Matter of fact, in John chapter 14, Jesus, when he's getting ready to be cr uh, crucified and, and getting them ready that, that man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you, but I'm going to come back for you, but I'm going to leave you, but I'm coming back, but I'm not going to leave you by yourselves. You're not going to be on your own because I'm going to send another who is just like me, Jesus said. And he's going to be your counselor. He's going to be the one that, man, he's going to guide you. He's going to give you counsel. And he's going to be your comforter. How you've always come to me for comfort. Man, he's going to be your comforter. He's the one that, that, that you're going to go to and, 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 and get comfort. But he's no longer going to be just beside you. He's going to be in you and he is the Holy Spirit in us you see the Holy Spirit did not come and live inside of, of, of God followers until Jesus was resurrected until he left and we have the Holy Spirit living in us and that's why I'm asking you do you feel the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life every single day because Brother, sister, this is God. This is God in us. Man, the video, awesome video. Uh, you know, you just kind of sit and you begin to look at, I mean, by God's spoken word, He created. This is the God that lives in us. And sometimes I wonder for myself, David, why in the world do you give in so easy to Satan and his demons when I've got God living in me? And I'm going to be honest with you. I think what, what it is, 
I'm not thinking of my salvation. I'm not thinking of my freedom, my deliverance. And again, I think this is part of transformation with us because as I get older, man, I am just reveling in the freedom that I have in Jesus Christ. I can love anybody and I can love everybody. And I don't have to care what anybody else thinks. I don't have to care what even my fellow church people think. And believe you me, I have caught it through the years by being with a certain person or a certain group of people or whatever because, hey, man, that doesn't look good. And even when those people gave their life to Jesus Christ, they were still not accepted. And as I've gotten older, I realize, you know what? I've got freedom in Jesus to love every single person. I don't care who they are. I don't care what they've done. I don't care what they're doing at the moment. I can love them. And I can serve them. And I can be light. So look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Here, listen to what he says here, and here's how transformation takes place in our life. He says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature desires. Let the Holy Spirit guide your life. And church, when we let the Holy Spirit guide our life, I'm not going to do what my sinful nature craves. He didn't say you might not. He said you will not do it. So the question is, is whenever I cave to Satan and his attacks and this warfare that we're in... What's the issue? The issue is not where is God. The issue is why am I not letting the Holy Spirit of God in me guide my life? He says in verse 17, the sinful nature, it wants to do what is evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other so that you're not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you're directed by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, you're not under obligation to the law of Moses' church. It is not about do's and don'ts. It's not even about following the Ten Commandments. You know why? Because we're following the Holy Spirit. And it's not that we just ignore it. I hope you understand what he's saying here. It's not me following the law that's going to make me right with God. It's going to be the Holy Spirit. It's not going to be me following laws and Ten Commandments that's going to keep me from caving to the enemy. Can I ask you, how's that worked for you? If you grew up in a very conservative, very... Um, rules-oriented church. Man, I don't know how hard I used to try. I'd read something in the Bible, and man, I'm supposed to do that, and i just think about it and think about it and think about it, and then all of a sudden, man, when it's sitting out there in front of me, I didn't have any power. But you see, when we have the Holy Spirit of God living in us and the Holy Spirit of God is guiding us, when that thing is sitting in front of me and sitting in front of us, we've got power, amen? we got power. And it's not our power. Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. So he says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, in verse 19, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, Outburst of anger, selfish ambition, 
dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Can I tell you that I've been in that list and at times still am? But can I tell you that that used to be my lifestyle in, in several of these? Oh, I was going to church. I was reading my Bible. I say my prayers every night. But I was trying to follow the law. I was trying to follow rules. I didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit living in me. That I had God living in me. Do you know what it's like to feel so guilty and so dirty? Because you know you fall so short of what God intends for you? And you know what that does? Man, that just gives Satan a bigger foothold to just flood you with all sorts of things. Because it's a mindset. My mindset becomes, oh yeah, I'm going to church and I'm doing these things, but I am no good. There's no way that God can love me. God can't love me because I'm not like Chad. I'm not like Marcy. Man, I'm no good. And whatever our mindset is, that's what's going to come out of us. There's a young 16-year-old student that Sherry and I are kind of trying to help because of his mindset. It comes from a very bad, bad, bad situation. Parents just recently got divorced. I mean, there's always fussing and fighting and, and you could hear the screaming and, and the throwing and, and I mean, just all sorts of things going on. Always in trouble at school, always. 16, just always in trouble. There's certain classes he wants to take, but he can't take them because, or be part of a certain club or something like that because his grades are in the tank. Their dogs got out and were roaming the neighborhood and, 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 and Sherry saw them and, and she asked me, she goes, hey, did you see it? And I said, yeah. She goes, where are they? And I said, well, they're running up and they're, they're almost on the highway by now. And, and so Sherry hops in the car, she goes out, she gets those dogs, she brings them back, she tries to find where they got out at. She couldn't figure out where they got out at. So she put them back in the yard anyway. The only thing she could figure is, is that they pushed the gate wide enough, even though it's still locked, where they could just wiggle out of it, although they're pretty good-sized dogs. And she put some rocks up, so after school, as she was doing her crossing guard duties, she, she called him. She said, hey, come here a minute. And the first thing this kid did was, he goes, what now? Oh, man, what now? What have I done now? And I mean, he just went to cussing and everything else and throwing his hands and flailing because he goes, what have I done? See, his mindset is, you're no good. You don't do anything good. And Sherry just finally had to say, hey, 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 I just want to tell you about your dogs. I want you to go home, and when you check, make sure that your dogs are in the yard. And here's what I did. We got to change our mindsets. And we got to help people change their mindset. We're trying to share Jesus with them. But how about us? 
How many of us are looking at this list in Galatians chapter 5 and we go, up, oh, up, oh, circle that one, up, oh, circle that one, up, oh, boy, that's me, that's me, that's me. I'm going to tell you something. Get your mind out of that. That's not who you are because if you belong to Jesus, you have given your life to Jesus and you're a brand new person. The old is gone. Does that mean that you're ever, never going to slip back up or, or, or that's going to creep in on occasion? It will. But praise God for Jesus because His blood continuously cleanses us from all our sins. We continuously are being delivered and set free by the blood of Jesus. And it changes our mindset. And, and the Holy Spirit, guess what He does in verse 22? But the Holy Spirit, man, He produces this kind of fruit. And it's not fruits, it's fruit. It is one fruit. Here's what the Holy Spirit produces in our life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Man, there is no law against these things. This is the fruit of the Holy Spirit in you, in me. Does this describe you? Or have we been listening to the enemy? He says in verse 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus. Do you belong to Jesus? Do you belong to Jesus. Well, then you have nailed the passions and desires of your sinful nature to His cross and crucified them there. You have killed them on the cross of Christ. And since, takes it for granted, man, if we've done that, the Holy Spirit saying, well, since you've done that, we're living by the Spirit. And let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. Belonging to Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 23 says, And you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. I read that the other day, and I probably have read it, I don't know how many thousands of times, but all of a sudden it really hit me. David, you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. So I belong to Christ, and I belong to God through Christ because of what Christ has done. I belong to God. I belong to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That answers some of the biggest questions that people have in the world. Always have. Who am I? Why am I here? Man, I deal with that. Gary, I don't know about you, but I deal with that every day on the bus. I mean, you see it, you hear it. You talk to the students. Gary drives the bus at Dunlap, by the way. People, and, and, and young people, but, but not just young people, all people. Man, they're fighting for their identity. Who am I? And I see a lot of people fighting for their gender identity. Who am I? I don't even know what gender I am. And I want to tell you something. Love them. Love them. I have fallen so in love with these students. Serve them. Be Jesus. 
Because there's so many people, and it's just not that. I mean, every people are fighting for their identity. They're trying to figure out, you know, students go to school. When you're in school, what's your identity? I'm a student. Well, what do you do? Well, I learn. You go to college. Well, I'm still a student. What do you do? I learn. Then you get a career. And, and I think this is why so many students now, and, and they're younger people today, they're trying to find careers that they can find their identity. Because they want their lives to matter. And then all of a sudden they get started in their career and they're, they're not satisfied. They're not content. There's a big hole there. And the problem is the only person that can fill that hole is not a career, it's not school or, or some other person. It is God. Because we're all created in the image of God. And there's this hole there that people, and sometimes we are trying to fill with all sorts of things, but God is the only one that can fill that hole. Mike Cope had a book, oh, I don't know, man, 30, 35 years ago, One Holy Hunger. And that's what that whole book was about, was that holy hunger of trying to find something to give me satisfaction. People are fighting for their identity. They're fighting for success. They're fighting to be loved. Just fighting to be loved. I just want somebody to love me. And sometimes even us as believers are doing the same thing. But you, uh, let me just, when you look at the Holy Spirit and what He's doing in our life and transforming our life, you know what? I know whose I am. I know who I am because I know whose I am. I belong to God. You belong to God. We know who we are. We don't have to fight for our identity. We live out of the overflow of our identity. We live out of the overflow that we belong to God. I know who I am because I know whose I am. And I know God loves me. All i got to do is look at Jesus. I know that I'm loved. So we don't have to fight to be loved. Church, we live out of the overflow of God's love for us. Amen? Just think about that. We live out of the overflow of God's love for us to every single individual we encounter. That's sweet. And we don't fight for success because we have every blessing every spiritual blessing Ephesians 1 tells us we have every spiritual blessing that you can imagine every one of them through Jesus Christ man time flies do we understand how Salvation is the helmet that protects our mindset now. Because I've got more, but I think I need to stop. Let me just end with this verse, and then we're going to do the, the Lord's Supper together. 1 John. And every, every time I read this passage, 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, every time I read this passage, I'll always, always, have somebody in our gatherings, whether it's here or other places I've been, that just tell me, oh, that's not right. You're, you're, you're not preaching it right. You're not teaching right. But don't want you just, just read First John chapter 5, verse 13. Well, let's pick up verse 11. And this is what God has testified. This is God's testimony to us. Okay? He has given us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. What is He saying? God's testimony is He's given us eternal life. Where is that eternal life? It's in, it's in Jesus. It's in His Son. How many of us are in Jesus today? Thank you, Sandy. <laughs> Got one hand up. How many of us have eternal life? 
I mean, have Jesus. We have Jesus. So that means we have eternal life. We have life. And the life he's talking about, we have eternal life. When? Now. And he says that in verse 13. He says, I've written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Do you believe in the name of the Son of God? Do you believe in Jesus? Well, I've written this so that you may know that you have eternal life. There is nothing that can change that. Because of Jesus and your faith in Jesus, we have eternal life right now. Oh yeah, they may kill this body, but they cannot kill my soul. See, we're living for a different land. We're living for a different place. And so Satan... Come at us. And that's kind of scary to say. But I want to tell you something, church. If you've got the helmet of salvation on, he cannot get to your mind. We know what a helmet does. You look at football, um, motorcycles, skateboards, lacrosse. These helmets, it's to protect the brain from blows. And Satan is trying to come out us with all sorts of blows to, to our mindset, and he cannot get it when we have the helmet of salvation. So let's celebrate what Jesus did. Amen? Let's celebrate what Jesus did on that cross. When he took our sin, became our sin. So Father... Thank you. Jesus, we celebrate you today. I know sometimes we, we, we treat this moment like, like we're at a funeral or, or mourning or something. But man, we ought to really be hooping and hollering and, and, and stomping and clapping because of what you've done on that cross. Man, we have eternal life right now through you. And like M.C. Hammer said a long time ago, nothing can touch this. Really. Nothing can touch it. Because of you, Jesus. Help us to strap on the helmet of salvation today. Thank you, Lord. And as we get ready for the fruit of the vine, Father, I just want to say thank you for your blood, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You did what we could not do for ourselves. You lived that perfect life. And you paid the price for us. Man, we know how excited and how giddy we get when we go to a restaurant and we go up to pay our bill and they go, oh, your, your bill is paid. And we're like, what? Oh, you're kidding. And then we just go out, man, just grinning. But man, Jesus, you've done something so much bigger, so much greater for, for all eternity. And it's so sad when we look at our world around us and all of the hopelessness and joylessness that's in our world today and, and all the, the feelings of being overwhelmed and all of that stuff. And God, that would be us if it weren't for you. And the blood that you gave for us. But God, I pray today that as we celebrate what you did for us on that cross and the blood you gave for us, that we don't keep this thing to ourselves. That even today as we go and as we leave this place, this gathering, Lord, that we'll tell others. Man, help us. We want other people in on, on this good news. Thank you, Jesus.